Last year, the world came together in Paris to reach an agreement to address the climate crisis. It was a historic moment. And it was just the beginning. Join us on our journey around the globe as we learn what it will take to build a healthy, clean energy future and what more we all can do. We'll hear from the leaders, musicians, experts, and everyday people leading the fight to make climate action a reality. This is 24 Hours of Reality. We're on the road forward. Welcome, I'm Sarah Backhouse. Thank you for joining us for 24 Hours of Reality, The Road Forward. Last year, the world came together in Paris for COP21, where 195 nations adopted an agreement committing to reduce greenhouse gases and limit rising global temperatures. It was a historic agreement, but it was just the beginning. Now comes the hard work of meeting these commitments. Travel with us tonight from our home base here at Liberty State Park, New Jersey, where the founder and chairman of the Climate Reality Project and former vice president of the United States, Al Gore, will lead us around the globe as we visit the top 24 greenhouse gas emitting countries. We'll explore solutions each nation has at hand, challenges they face, and how they can succeed in ensuring a sustainable future. We continue our look forward with our fifth of 24 countries, Australia. Australia is the 12th highest greenhouse gas emitter. The nation has committed to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 26% below 2005 levels by 2030. This year, the Great Barrier Reef experienced one of the largest coral bleaching events in history, but Australian cities are taking bold actions in the face of the climate crisis. And now, please join me in welcoming a man who has led the charge in educating and inspiring action on the climate crisis, the founder and chairman of the Climate Reality Project, Vice President Al Gore. Thank you, Sarah. What a great privilege to have you back again this year for 24 hours of reality. It's a joy working with you, and thank you for your personal commitment. So uh, the top 24 national emitters of global warming pollution, we've seen this list. Uh, for those of you who have been in other uh, hours watching. Uh, but now we're going to go to number 12 on the list, Australia. Uh, what an amazing country. It, it is always a joy to go to Australia. Uh, and of course, there is a big understanding and a big public movement uh, based on the commitment to saving the climate balance for our planet. I always start with Earthrise and the blue marble and shift to this incredibly iconic picture of what the atmosphere of our Earth really looks like from space, which confirms what the scientists have always told us. It's not a vast and limitless expanse in the sky. It's a very, very thin shell of atmosphere. And we're using this as an open sewer for our carbon-based civilization now. And that's the simple truth. We're filling it up with heat-trapping, man-made global warming pollution. And the biggest single source, of course, uh, um, agriculture, particularly animal agriculture, uh, bad forestry practices, transportation, a lot of things are involved. But the main source is CO2 emissions from the burning of fossil fuels. And as this uh, graph shows, the global emissions started skyrocketing after World War II and really started going up even faster after the Berlin Wall came down and globalization really took place. But in the last three years, global emissions have been flat, suggesting we are at an inflection point. And that's very exciting. The bad news is we're still putting 110 million tons a day up there, and it stays there for quite a while. And it's causing a lot of problems, chief among them uh, the rising temperatures. But look at this graph of Australia's greenhouse gas emissions. There was a big change. Uh, in the, in the pattern in the first decade of the 20th century, then it started uh, going up again. Now it's uh, begun to moderate, but the future is yet to be determined uh, where Australia is concerned. And it's kind of ironic in one way because Australia is considered by some scientists to be maybe the most vulnerable country in the world because it's in the southern ocean and the geographic placement of Australia makes it particularly vulnerable. We'll talk a little bit about that. 
But let's first of all look at where Australia's emissions are coming from. And we've gotten used to seeing the fact that uh, the bulk is from energy, and in Australia it's 60 percent, uh, more than a, another quarter from uh, agriculture. But let's focus in on that energy section and look at uh, the bulk of it uh, coming from electricity and heat and, of course, transportation. That's the same uh, in the U.S. Uh, also, manufacturing and construction and other sources. All of these can be reduced, and some of them are beginning to be reduced because Australians are really now keenly aware of the fact that 14 of the 15 hottest years ever measured have been in this young century, and the hottest of all was this, this year, even though there are two weeks left, of the, the statistics already show it's the hottest ever, uh, and it broke the record of 2015, which in turn broke the record set in 2014. It's very clear. Now, if you look at the specific effects of temperature increases in Australia, here are the number of days per year in Australia over 40 degrees Celsius. And for those of you in the U.S., 104 degrees Fahrenheit. This is uh, what it was uh, in 1990. And then in 2050, it's projected to be here. And by the end of the century, look at that dramatic change up to 192, uh, well over 100 days per year, let's say it that way, above 40 degrees Celsius in the bulk uh, of the country. This can have catastrophic consequences, and it's one of the reasons so many Australians are saying the world has to do more, and Australia, as part of the world, has to help uh, lead the way. Uh, heat waves in Australia already are five times more likely because of man-made global warming. And those of you from Australia can cite your own personal examples of how, what an effect this has been having. But it's not only the air temperature, it's the sea surface temperature around Australia. Just look at this graph. We're seeing, and this relates to what I'm saying about Australia being in the Southern Ocean. This dramatic increase in sea surface uh, temperature is having a huge impact. Uh, you know, more than 90% of the extra heat energy trapped goes into the oceans, uh, and it makes the storms, the ocean-based storms, much stronger, and it uh, increases the evaporation of water vapor off the oceans and makes the downpours more likely. Let's look at these things. The storms have been getting stronger. Category 5 cyclone uh, uh, Marsha last year caused widespread damage, and the downpours, this is only one of many examples that I could show you, but Australia is seeing less rainfall overall, but much more of it comes in these one-time huge extreme downpour events. Some people are beginning to call these rain bombs, and they're happening all over the world because of global warming. Now, at the same time, this, the extra heat that is pulling all that water vapor uh, out of the ocean into the sky, into these atmospheric rivers that cause the big downpours and floods, that same extra heat is drying out the land. Uh, here's an example west of Melbourne in uh, Victoria. Uh, farmers this year uh, in Victoria faced unprecedented water shortages. And of course, there's been a string uh, of years like that. Water stress in Australia is exacerbated by man-made global warming tremendously. And if you look at where Australia stands in the world as a whole. It is one of the most uh, water-stressed countries. And by the way, uh, this extra heat uh, causing the droughts also dries out the vegetation and makes the fire risk much, much higher. I could show you a lot of slides of the incredible fires that Australia has been enduring. Of course, it is a, a country that is prone to fire. There's a fire history of Australia. But what's been happening recently is very, very different. This iconic picture of an Australian firefighter uh, uh, helping a koala bear became a, a symbol, really, for many people of what the firefighters are doing in Australia. They have organized themselves uh, to become first responders not only to fire but to global warming. They organized a relay race across much of Australia, stopping in every town to rally people to, to lobby for solutions uh, to uh, global warming. 
So I, I really want to uh, give a shout out to the firefighters in Australia. They're r really terrific. Now, because uh, Australia has so many coastal cities, there is also the threat from sea level rise. Because this same extra heat that's causing the downpours, causing the droughts, is melting the ice regions in Antarctica and Greenland particularly. Uh, and we're seeing a tremendous uh, increase in damage from ocean-based storm surges with in increased sea levels. Uh, this one was in part of uh, Sydney, uh, where homes are being damaged. Uh, South Australians uh, uh, have uh, been warned about the insurance rates. This uh, is a, a group of seaside uh, properties in part of Sydney. And of course, when you talk about all the extra heat and also the CO2 going into the oceans, which acidifies the oceans as well as making them warmer, that is one of the principal reasons for the uh, tremendous threat to one of the world's greatest natural wonders, the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, the bleaching event uh, uh, over the past year is the worst ever recorded on the Great Barrier Reef. And of course, this is a World Heritage site that is, uh, I mean, it's a, a world jewel that Australians care deeply about, the whole world cares deeply about. So, but in spite of this bad news, which has led to increased awareness in Australia, there's a lot of good news because Australia did go to Paris and join with virtually every country in the world to sign the Paris Agreement, agreeing to work together with the entire world to bring net greenhouse gas emissions down to zero as early in the second half of this century as possible. And Australia's specific uh, commitment uh, to the Paris Agreements uh, states a, a commitment to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by more than one quarter, 26 to 28 percent below 2005 levels uh, in less than 15 years. That's an impressive uh, commitment. Uh, we'll look later at what more might be done, but let me focus now on the incredible availability of these cost-effective solutions. And as in much of the world, we're seeing renewable energy really take off in Australia. Look at the dramatic increase in the uh, wind energy generation uh, in Australia. Uh, there are lots of locations where both wind and solar are now cheaper than electricity from uh, burning coal or natural gas. And where solar is concerned, the price of solar cells has been coming down so rapidly. As I've said before, it's almost like the computer chip revolution where the cost keeps on going down, 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 even as the quality goes up. That's happening with solar now. And the solar capacity in Australia, look how it began to take off in 2009, and, and it's really skyrocketing. This is very, very exciting. In fact, in Australia, uh, now one and a half million residential properties have rooftop solar systems. That's more than one in six houses in Australia, and it's just beginning. And the utility scale solar is even lower cost, uh, and, and the cost is falling faster than was predicted just one year ago. It's very, very exciting. And of course, uh, Australia has an amazing solar resource, and both solar and wind uh, are creating a lot of jobs, more than 20,000 new renewable energy jobs in Australia. This is the booming industry worldwide. That's why so many countries are competing to be in, in first place and creating all of these new jobs that are going to be unfolding in the 21st century. Now, uh, in spite of the controversy in recent years about Australia's national policy, which now seems to be trending back in a somewhat more positive direction, that's a, a longer story, but in, in spite of what happens at the national level, and I do think it's moving in the right direction, I'm really incredibly excited about the leadership by the, by the Australian state governments and city governments. There's probably nowhere in the world, Canada's close on this, and there are some states in the US that are doing a great job, but the Australian state governments are really leading the way. Uh, South Australia has committed to net zero emissions uh, by, by mid-century, and 50% renewables in, in uh, just eight years. That's fantastic. Tasmania already generates 
percent of its electricity from renewables. A lot of that's hydro, of course, which is also usually good. Victoria, the state of Victoria, has established a target of 40 percent renewable electricity uh, in less than, in about eight years. That's uh, exciting. Also, Queensland ha has a, a, a target of 50 percent renewable electricity by 2030. And, and uh, Stephen Miles is one of the leaders there. We'll hear from him. We've seen a dramatic progress uh, in Queensland. And the Australian Capital Territory, I guess you could say for Americans, it's a little bit like the District of Columbia, uh, except bigger. Uh, the Australian Capital Territory has a target of 100% renewable electricity by 2020. Now let's look uh, at the cities. Two of the greatest cities anywhere in the world, of course, are in Australia. Sydney, there's the I iconic uh, bridge uh, going over toward the Opera House. The city of Sydney has pledged to go to 100% renewable energy in less than 15 years. Incredibly inspiring, and what a beautiful city it is. And of course, uh, Melbourne is uh, another great gym uh, that the whole, uh, whole world uh, is in love with. They plan to go to zero net emissions by the year 20. 20. Fantastic commitment. We had a training in Melbourne uh, not long ago with the Climate Reality Project, uh, and I was so impressed by what I learned there. Australia has already ratified uh, the climate agreement as of uh, last month. So let's look at how Australia could do better and strengthen its climate commitment. Uh, first of all, it could enhance its existing commitment with deeper absolute emissions reductions below 1990 levels. A lot of Australians are urging their government uh, to do that. The solutions are there in, to enable them to do it. They could also adopt uh, domestic policies like a price on carbon uh, to meet and exceed existing commitments and use the market forces uh, in order to do it. They could revise their national renewable energy target to give a lot more encouragement to even faster deployment of renewable energy, particularly solar and wind. And of course, they could diversify the economy beyond fossil fuel uh, consumption and production. Uh, I'm excited by what's going on in Australia. Uh, I'm particularly excited by all of the activism uh, in Australia. They are really helping to make a sustainable future a reality. Thank you. Thank you, Vice President Gore. Every hour, we'll be sharing inspiring solutions that are already in place in each of our 24 countries.